Hey church people, it's Rachel here, youth pastor at Clayton Community Church. I don't know why I say that. I feel like most of you guys know who I am at this point. Anyway, I just want to let you guys know about something awesome that is happening at the well with our students. Uh, Wednesday night, January 20th, during youth group on Zoom, we are hosting a special students' mental health night. Um, we're going to address questions that students have about mental health or flip side of that, mental illness. Um, we're going to give them tools. We hopefully want to empower them to take responsibility, control of their own mental health. Um, I'm a firm believer that our, our mental, our spiritual, and our physical health are all connected. And so we can't neglect one of them because the others suffer for that. Um, so we want to make sure that our students, especially after 2020, um, have what they need to, to start stepping into that, that role and taking care of their, their mental health um, so that their spiritual and their physical health can benefit from that. So it's going to be awesome, 7 o'clock, January 20th. Uh, and parents, we have a special follow-up for you guys. We're going to have that on Instagram Live Saturday, the 23rd at 5 p.m. You can join us there. We're going to have a special guest joining us to um, kind of follow up with what we talked with our students about, but then to give you guys as parents and caretakers some tools, um, some tips that you can use to model mental health, to make it a priority in your home and uh, empower you guys to be successful at that. So yeah, that's the update. That's the team, my friends. If you have any questions, you can contact us at studentministries at claytoncc.com. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be amazing. So hopefully we see you there. Um, can't wait to hear from you guys with any questions you have. Um, yeah. Okay. Bye guys.
I'm still 
avoid dark times and cultural upheavals. But the truth is how we go through these difficult times shapes our character and forms the very people that we are to become. And so we are in a series 
looking at the lives of resilient people in the Bible and asking ourselves, how is it that they became resilient so that we too could become resilient? So, Papa God, I ask that you would speak to us as we would look at your word and look at this whole thing of resilience and what brought about resilience in your people so that we could become like them, people who would help bring about an improvement to the culture in which we find ourselves. In Jesus' name and for his honor, amen. Today, we are going to look at the life of Moses because we believe that Moses was a fantastic example of someone who was resilient. But the question is, how did he get that way? Well, I have a few ideas that I'd like to share with you and to see what you think about them. So let's get a little background on the story of Moses for those any of the, those that may not be familiar. At the time Moses was born, the Hebrews were slave laborers in the land of Egypt. And uh, the Hebrews had grown in such number that the Pharaoh <clears throat> said that he wants to, to um, kill all male babies that should be born to try to curb their population growth. Well, Moses' mother doesn't go, uh, go by this edict. And so she rescues him and for three months tries to hide him, but realizes it's getting harder and harder to hide the fact that she has hidden her boy. And so she eventually puts him in a basket and places him in the river, the Nile River, and trusts that God will, will see to him. And uh, his older sister Miriam is standing in the, in the bushes to see what's going to happen. Well, sure enough, the daughter of Pharaoh comes down to the Nile River, discovers Moses in this basket, picks him up, falls in love with him, and decides she is going to raise him. Well, the, the older sister Miriam sees what's going on, rushes to the scene, and says, Hey, would you like me to go get one of the Hebrew women that would be able to nurse this child and care for him for you? And Pharaoh's daughter says, yeah, that would be splendid. So off she goes and gets her own mom, Moses' mom, and, and brings her back so that she can nurse him and care for him uh, in his early years. Well, we're not told when, but we just don't know that Moses was raised by Pharaoh's daughter in the palace, being told that he is the prince of Egypt. He is in line for the throne and um, uh, belongs in the palace. So he spent 40 years being told by others who he was and trying to live up to their expectations. Well, the book of Exodus chapter 2 and the New Testament book of Acts chapter 7 says at one point in time, a thought enters Moses' head that he should go check out what's happening to the Hebrews. And as he does it, he sees how they are being oppressed and, and, and terribly abused. In fact, it's such a terrible situation that Moses actually executes one of the Egyptians that's oppressing one of the Hebrew slaves. And a couple of Hebrew slaves see it. And uh, uh, the next day it says that Moses went out again and was trying to settle a dispute between two of the Hebrews that were there. And the one guy says to Moses, yeah, are you going to try and kill me like you did the Egyptian? Who, who, who said that you're supposed to rise up and be a judge for us? Well, unfortunately, Moses quickly found out just how perilous it can be to run off with uh, an idea that enters into your head. We have to understand that Moses was in a crisis moment. And he flees for his life. And he ends up in a land called Midian, which means strife. So he had 40 years in the palace being told, this is who you are. And this is your character. But very quickly that dissolves in a flash when he tries in his own strength to move out in that uh, place of, of trying to be what somebody else told him he should be. So for the next 40 years in the wilderness of Midian, Moses 
has to unlearn the ways of Egypt. And it doesn't, he doesn't exact, exactly bounce back in a brand new career of reinventing himself that now he has gone from the palace to shepherding sheep in a wilderness. And it's in this place where there emerges within Moses uh, an ability to um, not only shed himself of the trappings of who others told him he should be and the culture that he was surrounded with uh, at that time, the Egyptian culture, that he was learning is not who he really was. In fact, he got to a place in the quiet and the solitude where he began to become curious into the things of God. And this is what sets him up for what's about to happen. So let's open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. And uh, here is what it says. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. God isn't merely the object of a revelation. He is the subject controlling it. It's a real bush. It's a real fire. God entered this physical world in a very real and tangible way to disclose something about himself to Moses. Now get this. A blazing fire a bla in a bush that's not getting burned up. And Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight why the bush is not burned up. There's the curiosity. Why was that even in there? Is it because he could have just passed on by going, wow, there's a bush on fire. Huh, you don't see that every day. And then just go on his way. There's something about this that Moses stopped in his tracks. He didn't just observe it and then go about his life. He wanted to get dig deeper. There was a curiosity about what is this? I want to find out more about what is going on. And so when the Lord saw, verse 4, this is the key. When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to look, then God called to him. Whoa! <laughs> there it is. I believe when we are curious into the things of God, that is where we will discover the revelation where God comes to us and shows us something about himself that will forever change us. In this passage, it says um, that God called to Moses and he said, hang on, don't come any closer Remove the sandals from your feet, for this is holy ground. Now, there's only two places in the Bible where it says um, that uh, to, the, to the people who are approaching this holy site, remove your sandals, don't come any closer. Why? What? What does that have to do? Here it is. Moses had shoes on, and God says, remove your shoes. You see... I think shoes are what enable us to quickly flee a situation. When we take our shoes off, we intend to stay a while. <laughs> Y'all remember the Beverly Hillbellies, right? Hey, take your shoes off. Set a spell, right? <laughs> In this TV show, it was all about sit, sit down, sp uh, spend a little while with us. And when we take our shoes off to enter a place... We are saying we are not going to be in a rush to get out of here and go on our way. Now, there's a second thing about shoes, and it's this. Shoes, something that is man-made, insulates us and protects us from that which is God-made. 
when we have shoes on, we're not touching the 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 ground, the earth, right? Where it, our shoes insulate us, and for good reason, so you don't step on glass and cut your foot to shreds. But here's here's something I'd like to propose to you. I think in this passage, we are catching a glimpse of what it is that keeps us from God and where we are not vulnerable to God. You see, when you are walking barefoot, when you're walking without shoes, you become much more vulnerable. Now, there's nothing, there's no one more vulnerable than God. He has come to Moses. He is vulnerable. He is saying, I'm coming to you, Moses, and I want to show you something about who I am. And I'm asking you to be vulnerable with me as well. Don't pretend to be somebody or something that you are not. Just be yourself. Be vulnerable. I already know who you are. Will you be real with me? And here's the, here's the reason why I think it's so important. Because in the revelation where God reveals himself to Moses, and we're about to, to, to talk about what that revelation is in just a moment. In that revelation, faith is sparked in Moses, and that faith produces a resilience that will carry Moses into the next 40 years of his life. So, let me just stop right here and ask you this question before we go any further into the revelation itself. Where do you need to turn aside in order to seek after God? Where do you need to stop pretending before God? I encourage you to think about those. And if, there's a, if there are areas, I want to encourage you to become open and vulnerable to God because he is open and vulnerable with you and wants to meet with you. All right, let's go on to the revelation. Moses admitted that he's not qualified. Um, further on down, um, in, in like in about um, uh, verse 10, it says, um, God says to Moses, Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Egypt, out, um, uh, sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And, um, and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that when, that I have sent you, when you bring the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. And then it goes on, um, to say that God finally reveals his name to Moses, Yahweh. Uh, I am who I am. Now, this is what's so fascinating to me. Moses says, who am I? Who am I that I should go? First of all, when we really understand what God is asking of us to do in terms of bringing his justice or bringing his peace or bringing whatever positive attribute he is calling us to bring about into our homes and into our culture, we become painfully aware of how inadequate we are. But none of that matters to God. God is not looking for your ability so much as simply your availability. Heaven is so often just the opposite of what we think. Humility opens the door for, for exaltation. Emptiness before God allows Him to fill you Weakness opens the door for strength. Well, Moses gets it completely backwards. Who am I? And God says, I am who. You see, it's not about who you are, who I am. It's about who God is. I am who. Isn't that fascinating? We get backwards and God puts it right, and the right way to approach life every time. And this is the revelation that Moses gets. 
It's when we put God in his proper place. I am who? And you fill in the blank. That revelation that it's who God is with us that matters. And that revelation gave to Moses, the uh, birth in Moses, a faith. And that faith yielded an ability to be resilient for the next 40 years of delivering the people out of Egypt and taking them through the wilderness. My friends, I encourage you to think about what God is saying to you. The I am is with you. The I am is the one who qualifies you. His presence is what qualifies us. And His presence is where we get our identity. And that revelation, that self-disclosure of God will give birth to a faith in you that will lead to resilience in you to face whatever circumstances that you are facing. One more thing. The encounter with God, right? The encounter with God gave birth to faith. And that faith produced a resilience. I submit to you that the depth and the maturity of that resilience will be in direct proportion to your ability to seek after more of God's presence. Why do I say that? This experience with God in the wilderness, in the burning bush, changed Moses' life. It changed his perspective. It changed his thoughts about who he was. It changed his, his thoughts about what is possible and what is impossible. My friends, you're not being called to change. You may not be being called to change a nation like Moses was. But, but the things that God asks of us can seem impossible. But the one thing that is possible for Moses and the one thing that is possible for you and for me is to seek after God's presence. And once we have encountered his presence, once we realize he is with us, I am, is with us, then all the impossible things that God may be asking of us become possible. So choose to go after the one possible thing that will enable you to go after whatever the impossible things might be that you are being asked to change and to transform. In fact, this experience so defined Moses, that, and, and I submit this to you, to think about this, that experience of encountering God at the burning bush left Moses hungry for more. Every time he had an opportunity, he was after God's presence. In fact, in Exodus 33, so check it out on your own sometime, but in Exodus 33, God is showing Moses the promised land. And he says to Moses, you go on up, you, you, you can go on into the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you. And Moses was shocked. He's, he, he's like, what? No. God, if your presence is not going with me, I don't want to go. He spent leading the Israelites through the wilderness. His whole life mission. And he's saying, I don't want it. If it means I have to sacrifice your presence, I want your presence more than all the things that you have promised me. You see, way back at the burning bush, Moses had the self-disclosure of God given to him 
that God is with him, the great I am, Yahweh, I am. And that so changed his life. It birthed a faith in him to believe that God was with him to deliver Israel and to take the Israelites through the wilderness to the promised land. Moses had resilience that was matured and deepened by a continual pursuit of God's presence. I end with this. Good news. In Matthew 28, Jesus commissions his disciples and through them you and me and says, as you go about your life, make disciples of all nations. And lo, I am with you always. You and I, have the ability because Jesus commissioned us and because Jesus sent his Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of Jesus is with us. We have access, more access than even Moses had because Jesus went to the cross for us and Jesus gave his very Spirit to us that we can be in God's presence 24-7. So here is my ending challenge to you, if you will. You may not be called to change a nation, but you are called to change the environment in your home. You are called to change the environment from your home as you go about your daily life. So as you go, would you do this? Would you ask God, say, God, what is it that you would like to say to the people in my home, to my kids, to my spouse, to my parents, to my neighbors? What would you want them to hear? And then speak those words to them. The other thing that I want to challenge you to consider doing is this. You see... God's Spirit is in us as a river, not a lake. God fills us so that we would overflow with his presence to the people around us. So where is it that the Holy Spirit would want to flow to people in your home, in your neighborhood this coming week? Would you ask him? In fact, let me pray for us right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what we can learn as we look at the life of Moses and how that encounter with you led to faith which produced resilience and ability for Moses to withstand and endure and make it through the challenging circumstances that he was faced with. But most of all, it left him with an even greater hunger for you. And so, Lord, first of all, I pray that you would pour out a fresh encounter with everyone listening to, to, to me right now, wherever they are. It might be the morning. It might be the night. It might be Sunday morning. It may be Tuesday night. But whenever it is, I pray right now, Yes. Holy Spirit, reach in and touch that person. Let them have an encounter with you in their home, in their kitchen as they're watching this, in their office as they're watching this on their laptop, in their bedroom as they're watching this on their, their smartphone. And then, Lord, I ask, that you would so fill us up with your Holy Spirit that we would be able to hear what it is that you want to speak to people through us, to our, the people in our homes, the people in our neighborhoods. And where is it that you want to flow? Where is it that you want us to go to pour out your transforming 
self-revelation that will help to change the culture that is in such upheaval right now. You are a God of love. You're a God of joy. You're a God of peace. You're a God of hope. And I, right now I declare that mind, body, soul, and spirit, that we would grow it with you to become everything that you would want us to be to the people in our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. So sweet for thy lightning, I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders, I have resurrection power. Through the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is not testimony from death to die Cause Christ rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. Born with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Christ rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. From the day of my time, great things are still to come. Oh, I believe from the day of my time. Greater things are still to come. Yes, I believe from that day that you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Yes, I believe from that day that you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. Yes, I believe.
Turn! 